Hey there, good morning. I realize I'm standing in between you and lunch. I also realize uh, everyone has said all the best ideas, and I'm stuck here with just sort of the drivel at the end. Uh, I have a lot to say, and it compartmentalizes very simply into this. I think that big data is not BS. I think there is a there there. We have heard many other speakers today talk about what they characterize as their facet of big data. I'm going to give you one of my own as well. I think we're all sort of feeling the elephant as blind men, trying to see one aspect of it and not others. This is my aspect, although I think what George has said and what Mark has said and the importance of uh, data visualization by Kim and Simon and others have all been very critical. My goal now is to convince you of three things. And the first thing is that big data is going to have huge implications all throughout society, the manifest destiny of big data. The second thing is to point out what are some of the critical issues that are going on right now in terms of why there's a there there and a sort of a way to think about big data, sort of a concept to get us going as an industry. And the third thing is to talk about some of the problems that I think we're going to face and challenges with which society is unprepared. It starts here. There is a lot of information in the world today. We know this. The good news is that we can do great new things with it that we never could before. But the bad news is it leads to a whole host of new challenges with which society is unprepared. Let me begin by telling a story. The story is the story of Faircast. A few years ago, a computer science professor named Oren Etzioni Faircast. A few years ago, a computer scientist named Oren Etzioni was on an airplane. He had to go visit his brother's wedding in LA. So he knows what he's supposed to do. He buys his ticket well in advance because he knows if he purchases the ticket early, he'll save some money. He buys it early, but 40,000 feet high, he, the devil gets the better of him, and he starts asking people around him at, on the airplane how much they paid for his flight. He's a scientist. He's a computer scientist. This is what they do. And lo and behold, as you can guess, lots of people paid much less than he did for the same ticket, and of course, they bought it much, much later than he did. So he's incensed, and he thinks to himself, if only I could decrypt the, the, the method for airfare madness and empower customers and consumers with this information to know if they should buy the ticket or not. And then he stops short and realizes, actually, I don't actually need to know the reason why someone's buying a ticket or not, or why the airfare changes. What's the algorithm that the airlines use? All I need to do is have access to the data. Because if I look at what other people on the flight have paid and whether the price is likely to go up or down before departure, I'll know whether the price I'm seeing online is a good one or not, whether I should buy now because it's likely to go up, or if I should wait because it's likely to go down. He gets 12,000 pieces of data by scraping the internet, runs his algorithms and regressions, and lo and behold, the thing works. Gets venture capital money, creates a company, it's working well, saving consumers lots of money every time they purchase an airline ticket. Around 2008, he's crunching 225 billion price flight records with which to make his prediction. When he, he realizes it's not just for airfare. He can do this against hotel rooms. He can do this against used cars. Anything in which there is high price variability and lots and lots of data. Because as he adds more and more data to his model, the prediction gets better and better. In 2008, Microsoft knocks on his door, and he sells the company for $110 million. It's now Bing Travel. The point here is that this is something that he couldn't have done in the past because the technology didn't exist. Ten years ago, it would have been impossible for him to create a business like this, but now he can. But he's also certain that when the airline reservation system was created by IBM for American Airlines in the 1950s, they never thought that this information could be used to lower the price of tickets if empowered in consumers' hands. So what does this mean? First, in big data, data has become the raw material of production. It is a new form of economic value. Why is this happening? Yes, the technology is possible. We have faster processors. We've got better algorithms. We've got, uh, we have Hadoop. We have lots of tools that we didn't have in the past. 
And of course, the data exist. We are data, datafying the world, rendering into data form many aspects of living that normally couldn't have been captured in data form and therefore analyzed and processed. But also, it is about a shift in mindset. To think about data, think of it this way. What is big data? Things that you can say, see in a large body of data that you can't see in a small one, with which you can transform businesses, transform organizations, change the relationship between citizens and government, and more. Where does it come from? Well, we heard from George, and we looked at the origins of computing. We heard from Mark, and we looked about how data was used throughout the ages. Another place to start is with the simple game of checkers. In the 1950s, a computer scientist at IBM and later at Stanford named Arthur Samuel liked playing checkers or drafts. So he programmed a computer and software with which he could actually play the checkers against the, the ghost of the IBM 710 is, is, is in the room. Uh, so Arthur Samuels is now playing checkers and playing against the machine. And he's having lots of fun doing this. But he does a little tweak to the software. And what he does is he builds a little system into it so that he can learn with the software. And what, he can, what the computer does is it calculates the board at every single moment. What it's doing is it's looking at the likelihood that a particular board configuration is likely to be a winning board or a losing board. And then it does this again and again at every single move so it can determine what its move will be depending on whether the probability is that if it makes this move as opposed to another move, it will create a winning board or a losing board. Arthur Samuel leaves the machine to play itself. It creates more data. More data makes the prediction accurate. By the time it ends, around the late 1950s, this man has created a machine that can exceed its own talents at what he was trying to do. That is, if you will, the origin of machine learning, a branch of artificial intelligence, which is a branch of computer science. Big data is wider than machine learning, but if you wanted to look at one particular facet of why the data is so important, that simple principle would be where you would start with. Keep in mind, this was 50 years ago. We didn't have the tools to do it in a real robust way. We didn't have the data before, but now we do. And techniques that were used either for something rather trivial, like checkers, or something really, really important, like national security or Walmart, that did have the resources to do it, is now being democratized and being used by many, many organizations. It's now with us today. As Eric Feigenbaum said, computational intelligence is the manifest destiny of computer science and you could actually substitute some of those words and look at big data and why it's actually changing the world. There is a lot of data in the world. We have seen data about the data. Let me give you a, some riveting ideas. The first is, remember, in 1986, this is about 30 years past the 53 kilobytes in 1953 that George showed. There, almost all the information in the world was actually analog and very little digital. In 1986, 40% of the world's computing power was in the form of pocket calculators. Things changed in the 90s. By then, we saw the amount of analog storage grow, but also the amount of digital storage. Obviously, the point is that linear growth grows, excuse me, uh, linear growth grows linearly, but exponential growth grows exponentially, and the amount of digital content has subsumed the amount of analog content. This data is from 2007. The amount of data roughly doubles every three years. Yes, lots of different data about whether it doubles or not. This is from the University of Southern California, Martin Hilbert. And so if you think about in 2010, the green portion was twice as large, and the little gray portion on top was half as large. And then do that again. Double that again for 2013, and you get an idea of the scale with which we're talking of data. Mark told us about how the amount of books has grown massively because of the printing press, and so too we see these same trends coming on today. The term big data has been with us. It's not totally new. Yes, it started to be employed in the ninth, around the year 2000 by people in the astrophysics community and by scientists in biotechnology because their data sets were so huge, and that's why we're talking about the term today because it's jumped over from the sciences, but even the sciences has dealt with information overload problems for so long. Uh, of obviously, little science, big science was a classic around the 1960s, suggesting that this has been a problem that we've faced for a long time, 
and we still will. More isn't just more. More is different. A change in scale leads to a change in state. A quantitative change can lead to a qualitative change. And what we're seeing is big data address lots of problems and be applied to new areas that we could scarcely imagine in the past. First, big data is obviously, it's big. It's not just that, so it's a deeply misleading label. Who wants to pin their colors to the mast of big data on big? Don't, but it's a good place to start. So in the first area, we can see that uh, sumo wrestling, the national sport of Japan, we have identified match fixing in this one area because Stephen Levitt at the University of Chicago has able to look at the data, all of the wrestling matches in sumo for an entire decade and statistically shown pairings in which there's no other way to explain why one wrestler would win where another one would lose except for the fact that matches are being thrown. Likewise, big data is fast. Two thirds of the trading on the New York Stock Exchange, excuse me, in all US equity markets is done by algorithms. Big data is smart. You can take your phone, you can put it up into a noisy bar, and Shazam and others will tell you what song it is you want to, that you're listening to. Big data is predictive. At the University of Ontario, Dr. Carolyn McGregor is taking all the data that used to stream into machines and then stream out the back end and just get wasted and never reused and apply it to neonatal care, premature babies in which Interventions are incredibly important to catch problems early and to address them early to see if treatments are working so that you can use lower doses and actually respond quicker. She's able to identify infections 24 hours before the manifestation of the symptoms appear so that you can address it sooner and children can survive. Big data is recursive. What does recursive mean? Well, think about if I was to take the name Ed Dumble and type it into the Google search engine. Ed is one of the conference co-program chairs and I would misspell his name with one D instead of two. Now, there's nobody at Google who works in their spelling department that told the Google algorithm how to spell Ed Dumble's name. The system knew, the system learned. It learned how Ed spells his name Firstly, because it was able to look at all the data and treat them as signals into what is correct and what is incorrect. Secondly, it was able to look at all the interactions with which users clicked on the website and treated those signals as well and could tell what was correct or what was not. For example, if, I was to, if I, there was a reference to Ed Dumble with one D and it wasn't our dear Ed who's backstage right now, uh, and I go back and do another search to Google, Google knows that I didn't get what I was looking for. But if I never return to Google, it can infer that I found the correct website and that indeed was the person I was looking for. I should also add, Google applies that, tech, that system, that methodology of learning from user signals to everything that it does, such as uh, Google Translate, Google Voice, et cetera. Big data is recombinatory. It's taking different data sets and merging them together to do new things. Big data is ubiqu ubiquitous. We're putting sensors into all sorts of things. Vehicles are driving themselves and alerting emergency services when there's problems. It's looking and monitoring the engines so that, uh, of the car so if the pattern shows that there's too much heat or too much vibration and that pattern matches problems of known breakdowns, it alerts the driver to the fact that you need to pull into a service station because there's a part that's about to fail, not one that already has. All of these things have incredibly important implications. Uh, economic implications. The first one is that where the 20th century was the world of automation and the assembly line in which labor and manual labor got displaced by technology, here it looks like these algorithms and big data might actually jeopardize many white collar professionals who are working today. But there's new opportunities in addition to those worries and new rules. The first of the new opportunities is in the area of say social data. Let's look at one area finance. FICO determines whether you're going to be, it's a credit score, whether you can repay a loan or not. But what if a better signal, whether someone's going to repay a loan, is their social graph. If your friends are more likely to repay a loan, you are too. Suddenly, all the metrics of a 50-year-old company based on looking at the signals of loan repayment could be shifted to a new company and the value of the social graph could be placed there. These are the sorts of ways that big data is upending traditional industries. But there's lots of new worries as well. Typically, we've thought of it as privacy, big brother. But a new way of thinking about some of the problems is going to be minority report. If we have 
algorithms that can predict the likelihood of one behavior, such as an Amazon book recommendation, why wouldn't law enforcement use that to see if our predictable ability that we might actually commit a crime? And in fact, these sorts of systems are already being used today. There's a branch called criminal algorithmic criminology that is studying just these sorts of things, not as science fiction, but as real world issues. So if you think about it, the worry is not just privacy anymore, but propensity. Wither free will in this universe. These are the ethics of big data that we all need to confront because society is going to need to think about just these things. It means that we're going to need new rules. The default setting of society has shifted. There was a book a few years ago named Leet by Victor Meyer Schoenberger that made the point that the world had shifted from a, from a universe in which things were forgotten to a digital one in which it was very easy to remember things. George Dyson's definition of big data fits perfectly into this, in which we are now able to capture more information, ever more information, than, than because the cost is so low that it takes human beings more time to actually do things than to, to delete things, than to actually just keep it. And so the data is just accreting. We've seen this sort of shift with copyright. We used to protect content in media. Now we want you to share the content on the bottom of our articles. Likewise, on social media, privacy rules were founded on the idea that you want to protect information and not share your personal details. Social media, like Facebook, suggests that you want to keep it open. And so too with big data, the world used to be something where you had to proactively decide to measure and capture and quantify data. Now it's going to take a lot of effort for people to decide not to. You're looking at an RFID tag right now that is actually the size of the, the indent of, the, of a fingerprint. We are in a new era, just like in the space age, in which uh, when we had the astronauts lift off into Earth and go into outer space, you could imagine that they were looking down on Earth wondering, the world has completely changed. But when they landed back on Earth, what they needed to do was to fill out a customs form for all the things they were bringing back. And if you thought that Commander Armstrong felt like, maybe the world has changed, and that this really isn't the right possible form with which to do these things. You can imagine that there was also indeed a regulator behind it who said, maybe this isn't the right thing either. Yet we are still trying to work our way through some of these problems. The printing press begot free speech laws. What will big data beget? What are the principles that we need to preserve? What is the most precious thing that we're going to need government with which to sanctify in this new era? When Socrates drank the hemlock because he had corrupted the youth of Athens, it was not, he couldn't appeal to free speech because it simply didn't exist as a concept. The printing press enabled that. What's coming up? Well, everyone has their guesses. I'm presuming that we're going to be in a world of trillions of sensors everywhere, measuring everything we do from our health to the environment. But when you think about it, the sensors are really us. It's every walk that we take, every heartbeat, our mobile phones everywhere. It is an infrastructure we're laying. It's going to happen without warning. Society is deeply unprepared. Thank you very much. <laughs>